Hello, Econ students. This is Mr. Stark. Uh, we are ready to start Standard 5, which is a fairly large standard. It covers big topics such as inflation, gross domestic product. Um, it covers things like the unemployment rate, uh, poverty, some really big issues we're going to be talking about. Um, and hopefully you got you are doing well um, now one of the things I did not get to do too much um, with you all um, was share some uh, some jokes that my uh, six-year-old now six years old uh, has come up with um, one of them I'm going to tell you now he just came up with today actually so hopefully this brings a smile to your face now keep in mind this is not my joke so before you send me um, virtual eye rolls this is my six-year-old but the joke goes like this um, what do when two volcanoes are married what does one say to the other when it leaves it says lava and if you need an explanation for that then feel free to discreetly email me and I'd be glad to explain what my six-year-old son meant uh, it took me a moment to get it but uh, anyway I think it's clever and cute for a six-year-old um, and if you want to meet my six-year-old Braxton you can refer back to the video I posted on my uh, haiku site um, introducing you to my family virtually uh, but anyway we are going to start off this with inflation um, inflation is something that most students have heard of if not then that's okay many have not heard of it but I would like to begin it with some political cartoons um, feel free to stop this uh, video and examine the cartoons because as I've mentioned to you before each political cartoon tells a story so this cartoon obviously shows a lady shopping uh, her car is labeled inflation and if you notice um, the farther she goes the more she loses from her cart because of inflation so that should give you one clue to what inflation is second one cost of gas 2004 versus 1984 um, not much explanation needed here but obviously this shows that um, quite quite a bit more uh, is spent filling up a tank of gas um, today than it was back in 1984 actually that's that's 2004 but even more so today uh, next one uh, this cartoon again doesn't bear much explanation but if you notice a couple things obviously there's rat gnawing on money so that gives you somewhat of a clue as to what inflation does to your hard-earned money uh, the rat is very fat um, they're in the desert and notice that the three gentlemen in the background aren't doing anything that's because the the artist message is, is that p many people are helpless to the costs of inflation Another one um, involving one of my greatest fears, which is sharks. Uh, it was with much hesitancy that I posted this one on the PowerPoint. Um, but this one, the shark represents inflation and the person struggling to stay afloat is wages. Um, obviously, um, shark, well, to be fair, most sharks don't bite people. But in this image, the inflation, the inflation shark, obviously is about to take a nice big bite out of wages. And then finally, this one was done by my high school art teacher, who is a retired syndicated cartoonist for the Indianapolis Star, and his cartoons appeared in hundreds of newspapers throughout the country. His name is Gary Varvel, upper left-hand corner. But this shows you that uh, basically, if you look at the newspaper, Greenback, which is another nickname for our, for our money, our paper money, um, the value of it goes down because there's so much of it. It's no longer accepted, which has never happened in modern history, but he's using hyperbole to prove a point. Um, even at some point, it becomes so worthless that even kids selling lemonade will no longer accept our dollar, which again has not happened. And uh, I think most economists would agree that even with the situation we're in right now, um, that's not going to happen. So, anyway, be assured of that. Uh, so, inflation. Um, hope you might have gotten from the comics what inflation is, but it is a sustained rise in the level of prices. It's not just a minute, or it's not just, I'm sorry, a uh, you know, week or even a year. It is a sustained raise in prices. 
I've told you before that my first job um, was at a movie theater in 1998 in Greencastle, Indiana. And for an opening night blockbuster movie on a Friday night, 7 o'clock, prime time, it cost around five fifty a ticket. Now, um, it costs you upwards of probably $12 plus, depending on how comfortable your seat is and how, much, uh, how many Ds in it, if it's 2D versus 3D and all the other things. Um, so prices have gone up consistently for movie tickets. Same things with most items. If you look at this picture, it pretty much sums up inflation. You have $20 above each cart. In 1998, $20 could buy you all that. In 2005, $20 could buy you that. And then in 2013, as you can see, the cart's almost empty. Um, now, I don't necessarily believe that inflation is robbing you of purchasing power. It's something that isn't necessarily always a bad thing, as we'll see. Um, but obviously, this picture gives it a very negative connotation. Um, so you're going to be doing the inflation article uh, after you finish the notes here. Um, but there are two types of inflation, two main types. Uh, one can be decent as far as, you know, good for an economy. Other one, rarely so. The first one is called demand pull inflation. Uh, this is ultimately caused by consumers. Consumers are the cost for this. Um, basically, consumers are getting money um, and they are spending it quickly. As I've told you time and again, in America, we are spenders. Uh, the more money we get, the more money we spend, generally. Um, at a certain point, if there's people demanding more goods than are out there, we talked about this, when there's less supply of things, prices go up, hence inflation. Um, demand pull inflation. Uh, this is a picture of the mayhem that happens on Black Friday um, when people with money spend it left and right. Um, and again, this is not always a bad thing because our economy runs on pretty much demand. I mean, that's what we're seeing with our economy right now, why it's struggling is because people are being told to stay inside and shelter in place, which is the right thing to do. Um, but people are not demanding things from a lot of businesses they normally would, like restaurants and um, tourism and, and different what's considered non-essential businesses, uh, which is causing the downturn in our economy. Um, so if people do have demand or are demanding things, that means money is flowing through the economy. It can mean that people have money. And if people have money, that generally means they have an income. They have a job. So demand pull inflation, you know, I think the average inflation in the United States is between one and 2% a year. Um, that could be a healthy amount. It means people have money and are spending it. The second type is called cost push inflation. And this is rarely a good phenomenon. This is caused by some sort of price shock or something occurs in the world that causes a much used resource to spike in prices. We talked about the uh, 1973 oil crisis, where uh, because we were siding with Israel in one of their wars with their Arab neighbors, OPEC, the group of uh, countries, mostly in the Middle East, that control about half the world's oil, um, they cut off oil to us. So oil prices spiked. Well, if you can imagine, our world, even with all the alter alternative energy sources, still runs on oil much more so back then. And so everything that needed oil from cars to farm machinery, therefore farm produce to all other things, including military spending went up, uh, prices spiked and that caused um, cost push inflation. And that can cause, as we're gonna see in the next slide, what's called a wage price spiral, um, which I'll go ahead and show it to you now. Um, this is the wage price spiral, this from the 1970s. So if you look here, some sort of event that causes an, uh, the price to skyrocket for a much used good. I mean, if you want to put instead of oil, you can put something like plastic because plastic's used in so much. Um, and uh, therefore, all the producers that use oil in their products, which is a lot, they have to raise their prices because it's more expensive to make their products, hence, more expensive for consumers to buy it. Well, um, in order to pay for that, um, they raise prices. Therefore, consumers need more money to buy these goods. They go to their employers and ask for a raise. 
enough people ask for it and enough, you know, collective bargaining strikes being threatened through unions, they get their raise. Well, that means that uh, producers have to raise their prices even more to make up for the money they're spending extra on their employees' salaries. So, and it just goes around from there until the price from the good that started it all, in this case oil, goes down, which when the war ended in 1973, um, the crisis was over. All right, uh, so let's talk about the impacts of inflation, the different things that happen because of inflation. Now, obviously, the first one, um, the value of the dollar decreases. Um, so the dollar is not worth as much as it previously was. Think of that picture from the first slide of the grocery carts with $20 above it. $20 is $20 is $20, but it's worthless if it can't buy you anything. I use this example a lot. If you're stuck on a desert island, no one there, you know, no shops, no civilization, nothing there, and a, and a plane full of money, millions of dollars washes ashore, that really doesn't get you very far because it's there, it's purchasing power is zero really um and so the value of the dollar decreases the more money is put in the economy um, we've talked about this with supply basic supply principle the more you supply of something the less it's worth that applies to our currency our money in the economy as well um this hits people with fixed incomes hard people that don't get automatic raises um and this is just a side note, uh, when you do, um, you know, whether after high school or after college, are applying for your first jobs and, um, you know, you get past the first interview where you basically make the cut and in your second interview and, you know, you're asking more questions. Uh, a great question you could ask, which is very telling, is whether they offer what's called cost of living increases guaranteed every year. As I told you, inflation happens, it's about 1% to 2% a year. It's like gravity. It always eventually wins out. Um, therefore, if you're not getting a 1% to 2% raise every year, at least, you're actually getting a pay cut because your money you're making is actually purchasing less. So ask about cost of living increases. Um, if that's a good side note. Um, so people like on Social Security. They, are, they don't always get cost of living increases. Now, every, in every five to 10 years, they do some social security cost of living increases, but not every year. Um, so if you're on just social security, um, it, you're losing money every year because of inflation. Uh, second one is interest rates go up. Um, it becomes more expensive to borrow money. Um, and if you think of all the things that you borrow money on, um, that can really catch up with you, uh, whether it be college loans, car loans, or the biggest mortgage loans. Um, I usually do this example on the overhead in class, but I'll just verbalize it to you. Um, basically a, a uh, hundred thousand dollar house, if you're paying it over 30 years, a 30 year mortgage and your mortgage rates around, around 4%, um, you'll actually end up paying about 170-ish thousand for that house. So 100,000 for the house and then $70,000 in interest back to the bank. The bank's making $70,000 off of you. Just a one half percent interest rate. So instead of paying 4%, you're paying four and a half percent interest rate. Um, you will pay an extra $30,000 for that house. So even a small percent increase in interest can cost you quite a bit, um, as the example here with Fred um, also shows you. And then finally, uh, decrease real returns on savings. So it's good to have a savings account. Your money's safe there. Um, matter of fact, it's probably safest in, the, in a savings account because even if the bank goes out of business, a tornado destroys the bank, people make a run on the bank and all the money's gone, your money is insured by the federal government, what's called the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Company, um, up to $250,000. So if you have up to that amount in the bank, the government will repay you that amount. Um, so it's very safe in a savings account. 
but it does not grow for the most part. I think the average is around maybe one one maybe one tenth to one half of a percent of interest they pay you for putting your money in a savings account. And if inflation is one or two percent, you do the math, you're losing money every year. But again, you put it there because it's safe. Um, not because you're trying to make it grow. If you want it to grow, you you know put it in a a, a certificate of deposit, which we'll talk about in a later standard, or put it um, in the stock market, or you can buy bonds with it. We'll talk about those next standard as well. Uh, so, uh, given what you just learned about inflation, one of the things that we typically enjoy doing at the end of this class is. Um, what movies, when adjusted for inflation, um, actually earned the most money? For example, when movies first started coming out in the early 20th century, it cost like 10 cents for a ticket. It's not fair to compare those movies to today where it's $12 a ticket. So when you adjust for inflation, which movies made the most money, so sold the most tickets? Uh, and I'll give, give you a hint. Most ones we think about are not on there. Um, in game. It's not quite there yet. Avatar, it's not in the top 10. Um, most of the Marvel movies are in the top 50, but they have not cracked the top 10 yet. Um, so if you want to stop and try to guess, you can, but I will ruin the fun for you here in a moment. So off the top of my head, movies that made it in the top Top 10. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Um, the Titanic made it in the top five. Um, the Exorcist made it in the top 10, as well as Jaws made it in the top 10. Um, number three, I think, was E.T. Number two, you know, this had to be in there, Star Wars, the original New Hope. Uh, 1977, and number one from, gosh, the late 1930s, Gone with the Wind, the three-hour-plus-long epic uh, during the Civil War. Uh, so anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Um, we're going to go ahead and go through this section, too. Ordinarily, we'd spend do this in the next class, uh, but since we're skipping out of some activities, we'll go ahead and get through the rest of the notes on inflation. Uh, so in this activity in your notes, take a look at each situation and decide whether they win or lose in that situation. Um, so a family who just took out a mortgage on a new home and they do not have a fixed rate mortgage, which means their mortgage, their interest rate can change with inflation. You can get a fixed rate mortgage, meaning that even if inflation goes up, your interest rate will always stay the same. But you need a pretty good credit score for that. And we'll talk more about credit scores again next standard. Uh, but in this situation, um, they lose because their interest can increase with inflation. Uh, second one, landlords own a home that is fully paid off um, that they currently rent out to other people. Uh, well, all paid off, so they don't owe any money. They gain because prices go up. That means more money being paid to them uh, for their apartments. And then finally, Lily, who was given a bond to pay for college from her grandparents. When she was five, her grandparents put a $10,000 bond at 3% interest in her name. Two decades later, she's ready to use it. Um, but inflation has basically gone up by 5% during this time. Well, simple math, um, 3 minus 5, negative 2. So her bond has lost 2% of its purchasing power. Um, so ultimately, they lose. But really, Lily doesn't lose because I mean, it's a gift to her. But the bond loses. Uh, OK, so how do we measure inflation? Um, three things. We look at uh, consumer price index, basically dozens of the most commonly bought goods like gasoline, uh, houses, cars, uh, eggs, bread, milk, things like that. Um, and economists measure the percent change of each one of those, how much percent they've gone up um, from year to year or even quarter to quarter. Then they average it out. Um, and that gives you the consumer price index. Producer price index is the same thing, except it's with uh, things that producers use to make their products. Uh, and then the inflation rate is ultimately the rate at which prices have increased. 
um, which as I told you, um, usually it's between one to 2% a year. So pretty manageable. Again, you think to yourself, can, can I reasonably ask for a one to 2% raise every year? And that's pretty manageable. Now, when it gets above 5%, then you're, you know, when wages can't keep up with it, then you run into problems, as we're going to see. Uh, this is the inflation rate um, in the United States from 1990 to 2019. As you can see, the highest it ever got to is 5.4%. Uh, there was actually deflation during the, the recession in 2008, 2009. Um, deflation, the lowering of prices, is never a good thing, um, as, uh, as we'll talk about here in just a moment. Uh, this is inflation rate around the world. Interesting map. So blue, it's zero or less than zero. Now, again, that's not a good thing because that's deflation. It means people, prices are going down because people don't have money. They're not spending it. Uh, green is the best because that's creeping inflation. It's inflation that's at a small rate. People can, you know, keep up with it with their wages. Um, no surprises there, really, as far as most of the world. And then when you get to 25 to 5.5%, not terrible but you're getting into kind of some dangerous territory. Uh, above 5%, orange, not good. Um, dark orange, and into the double digits, that's definitely a very bad sign. And then above 15%, um, that's critical. Uh, and here are the types of inflation. I mentioned one before. Uh, you have um, creeping inflation, which is a small rate of inflation, like you know one to two to three, even below 5%. Uh, galloping inflation, you know, over 5%, even into the double digits, never a good thing. Um, it means that, um, usually means that you're not able to supply, your country is not able to supply for the wants of the consumers on a regular basis. And then hyperinflation, um, this is the crazy stuff like, you're gonna watch a video, um, it's on the haiku site of 1920s in Germany, they lost World War I, they're responsible for paying the cost, so they just started printing off marks, Deutsche marks, their currency, flooded the market with them. As I told you, the more you supply of it, the less it's worth. And you had crazy things like, you know, newspaper costing 20 billion marks. Um, the biggest case of hyperinflation that I ever heard of was uh, in the 1950s or late 1940s after World War II when the uh, Soviet Union had taken over Hungary. Um, if you, at a certain point before they basically their, their their economy collapsed, if you took all of the paper money and coins in Hungary, all of it in the whole country, put together, um, like in a room or in a house or something, and collected all the money in the country, it would be worth less than one U.S. cent. Um, that is the most extreme example that I can think of. Deflation decrease in the general price level. Now you might think, you know, hey, that's great. You know, prices is going down because we like cheap prices. Bad news though, on the macro, the big view, this is always a bad thing. Uh, it's typically a bad thing because if creeping inflation can mean that people have money or are spending it, deflation means that people aren't spending money. And the biggest reason why people aren't spending money is because they don't have it which the next step on that or the next link on that chain because people don't have jobs unemployment's up so deflation usually happens in times of recession times of unemployment poverty goes up um, it wouldn't surprise me if we if this quarter or even the next quarter over the next six months there is some deflation in prices due to the financial stress we're having due to the coronavirus uh, this is called the deflationary spiral so if deflation happens long enough hard enough it can be sort of the death spiral for an economy. So if you follow my cursor here, um, demand goes down, people aren't buying things because they don't have money. Well, producers have to lower their prices. Um, most shop owners, most producers are in debt to banks or investors, so they can't pay back their debt. So they have to close their doors, they have to go into bankruptcy, which means all of the employees that work for them lose their jobs which gives them less money, which means they have less demand. And then the cycle just keeps on going and going and going. Um, now remember, in times, even times of great, even times of depression, which we haven't had since the 1930s, 
Um, deflation was only for a few years, but that still was a pretty bad time in our economy. Um, the last recession we had in 2008, um, don't really know if the, what we're in now is going to be called a recession. They're arguing about whether it's a recession or not right now. Um, but 2008, we only really had deflation for, you know, maybe six months. So it didn't last that long. Um, and if you look here, this gives you the inflation deflation rate all the way from 19, um, 1915 all the way up to the Great Recession of 2008, um, as you can see. Um, a lot of inflation, huge inflation during World War One. Lots of money being pumped into the economy um, in order to pay for military hardware. Followed by the Great Depression, um, or actually a kind of a, a short um, mini recession after World War One. Then came the Roaring Twenties. Then came the Great Depression. Some years of uh, deflation. Um, and then some modest recovery from the New Deal programs, but the real recovery came when World War II happened in this era. So we began pumping money into the economy uh, to create bombs and bullets and, and tanks and things like that. Uh, and then really, um, there was a short trail off after World War II and we started downsizing our military, the main spender at the time. Uh, but then things kicked back up again because this whole period is known as the Cold War, when our military spending was the big engine of economic growth at the time. Uh, and then starting in the 1990s, inflation kind of leveled off. We've had pretty moderate 3% or lower for the most part inflation since then. And that's it. Um, go ahead and make sure you watch the, doc, or the short video on in hyperinflation in Germany and read the article on the PDF and fill out the Google form. Uh, I will talk to you guys next time about gross domestic product. I hope you're staying well, staying healthy, and again, I miss all of you.